Amen. Here in James chapter 5, I'd like to focus on the last two verses of this chapter. If you'll look at verse number 19, the Bible reads, Brethren, if any of you do err from the, the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. This is interesting. He's speaking to brothers and sisters in Christ, and he says, you need to know this, you need to remember this, if you help a fellow brother or sister in Christ that's going astray, away from Christ, toward the world, and you convert them and turn them back around where they get close to God, he says, you might save that person from death. This is a hard saying, and it's really about hard preaching. This word convert is used in the Bible about converting somebody for salvation or those that lest they be converted. So the word convert is used in like converting somebody to become a Christian by having faith in Christ. But here he's using it to say those that are already saved, if a Christian will convert his fellow brother or sister in Christ and convert their mind to change their mind about living for the world instead of for God, he, boy, there's a great reward for that. That is honorable in the Lord's eyes. I do believe that uh, converting sinners, one of, one of the most important uh, loving things that you can do is to tell your fellow saints that if they continue in their sin, they're probably going to destroy themselves. I believe it's a blessing when we help brothers and sisters in their spiritual life. We go out of our way to say, hey, look, you're off the path of truth. You're sinning willfully. You're going against God's will for your life. And you know it while you do it because the Holy Spirit is inside of you. And sometimes God wants to use you as a Christian to tell another Christian. We need correction and chastisement from the Lord. He says, convert them. So, it's a Christian. They need to be corrected so they can be converted. Now, God uses the Holy Spirit to help us to turn it around. The phrase we often use is to repent of your sins. The problem is the false preachers use that to say, quit sinning to go to heaven. That's not what the Bible says. No, no, you're saved by faith in Jesus. Then, when the Holy Spirit moves in, and you have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, you can begin to stop some of the sins in your life that are actually destroying yourself. We need hard preaching. Perhaps you can save someone's life from destruction if you'll preach to them the Bible and warn them exactly what God has said. If you would go to Revelation chapter 3. Go with me to Revelation chapter 3. In Proverbs 9, it says that, uh, he says, rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. Sometimes you come to somebody and you're like, hey man, you're going in the wrong direction. And they're like, whoa, I was going in the wrong direction. Thank you so much. You helped me to stop making a big mistake. I love you. Right? Rebuke a wise man and he will love you. Proverbs 27 says, open rebuke is better than secret love. Sometimes when you're sinning openly, you need to be rebuked openly to get your attention. The illustration I use is to rattle your cage, to show you you're in bondage to sin, if you will. You're in Revelation chapter 3, find verse number 19. This is Jesus speaking. This is His revelation. He says in verse number 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Okay, God loves you. You're His child by faith. He's going to rebuke you. That means tell you you're doing wrong. And then chasing you means a correction. He's going to take away your blessing, and it might hurt. And His message to you is be zealous and repent. Get excited about turning back to Jesus is what it's saying. I want you to keep all this in mind. This is Jesus saying when somebody's going the wrong direction, we can help turn them around to get back on the right path. If you would, go to Psalm 19. Go to Psalm 19 with me. There's an awesome song directly out of Psalm 19. 
I've been singing it all morning, but I'll spare you, I won't do it right now. Uh, that would be special music, all right. It'd be real close to special education, okay? It might hurt your ears, okay? Uh, Psalm 19. I want to encourage everybody this morning and help them to remember Jesus told us, be zealous and repent. Why? Well, sometimes we go in the wrong direction and we need some help. Um, I will personally speak of in my life, there were times in my life where I began to go astray and a brother or sister in Christ rebuked me and I said, wait a minute, I've lost my focus. I got to get back on focus and on track for the Lord. Very helpful. I can tell you other times in my life where I was just apathetic and lackadaisical, not really caring about church, not really serving the Lord with my life, and I heard a good sermon, and boy, it was like a swift kick in the britches, and it's like, Lord, forgive me, I repent, I want to get back on fire for you, I need to be under some good Bible preaching, I need to get some Bible reading in my daily schedule. Let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. It's almost like there's a guy and he's going this way and this is the right way and he takes that left-handed path turn and he starts to go with the devil. He's listened to the influence and he's becoming worldly. He's sitting down with the unrighteous and he's walking with the unrighteous and he's about to walk through a door, and behind that door is a whole bucket list of sins. Things that fellow Christians would say, I've done that, and trust me, you don't want to do that. You don't want to make that mistake. You're going to lose power and life and money and reputation. You're going to hurt those that you love if you go that direction. What do they call it when somebody's so given to drugs that you have to just come in and help them and take the control? They call it an intervention, right? I guess you could call this a spiritual intervention. Sometimes we need to intervene and stop and grab somebody and shake them and say, what's wrong with you? You're going the wrong way. You're on the wrong path. There's a multitude of sins that you're about to walk into because you've gone off the path of truth. You're in the path of the error. You're making mistake after mistake after mistake. God wants to bless you, and you're walking away from His blessings. You're walking into a multitude of sins, and there's nothing good that comes from that. Curses. In Psalm 19, I, I want to share this with you. If you will, look at verse number 7. I love this. The law of the Lord is perfect. Perfect for what? Well, everything. God's Word is perfect. Now, we're reading out of James 5 earlier, and I want you to think about this. The book of James was specifically written to believers how to live their life. False prophets will go to James 2 and say you have to do good works to be saved. That's not what he's teaching. If you want God's blessing on your life, Christian, then obey Him and He'll bless you. And at the end of the whole book of James, he wraps it up by saying this one solid truth that if you convert a sinner, a Christian, by the way, there's two types of sinners, right? There's saved sinners and there's lost sinners. We're saved by faith, and yet you will continue to sin. Well, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. No, no. Be dead to that sin. Give up on that sin and walk away from that sin. And sometimes we need a friend to tell us. We need to hear preaching. The church ought to be a place where we preach hard against sin. We go out and we preach the gospel. We knock on doors. We talk to strangers. And we tell them that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's all by faith. You don't have to do any works. Once they take that gift and they're eternally secure forever, well then, God does want them to live right and not be a hypocrite. And when they don't, they're a disobedient child uh, that may get a swap from the Lord. They may get a correction from the Lord. James finishes the book by saying, if you convert a sinner, hey brethren, Christians, if you convert another Christian and you convince them to stop going down the wrong path of sin, there's a huge reward for you, and you're keeping them from ruining their life. There is a sin unto death. We talked about this recently. If you're saved, there are certain sins for you that God would just look down at you and say, no, you're done. I'm bringing you home. The kids have certain liberty in the yard, but when they get out into the street, they're done. Playtime's over. They're going in the house. They're grounded, right? 
I want you to see this in Psalm 19. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. That's what we're talking about is converting a sinner, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. It is a sure thing. You can trust it. It is everlasting life. He'll never take it away. He says in verse eight, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the the eyes. When we understand God's commandment, and if you notice, he called it the law, the testimony, the statutes, the commandment. These are phrases that he uses over and over in repetition in Psalm 119. We're in Psalm 19, and he says, this word can change your life. Most Christians are weak because they're not in the word, plain and simple. And if the word is in your heart, and the Holy Spirit is inside of you, and you see a weak brother or sister in Christ, you have the power to convert them. When we go out soul winning, knocking doors, preaching the gospel, if I find somebody and they no, I'm, I'm saved, I'm saved, and I start talking to them, and it's clear they're trusting in Jesus and they believe it totally, but then it's like you begin to see the sin in their life and they confess some things to you. I will usually at that point, I just say, okay, well, look, praise the Lord you're saved, but now I'm going to step on your toes. And of course, I mean that spiritually. Now I'm going to offend you and hurt your feelings, and tell you that you're living in sin, and God's not pleased with you, and you better get it right, or you're going to destroy your life. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. There are many Christians that are just, they're giving in to the world's pleasures, the lust of the eyes. What's on Facebook this morning? What's on TV? And they could care less about serving God or searching after His Word. We as born-again believers have a big responsibility, and it's a huge opportunity for a blessing to convert sinners and save them from their mess of sins that they're heading toward. We need to intervene. Look, he says in Psalm 19, verse 9, he says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Judgments, that's another word for His word. You see that also in Psalm 119. Judgments, commandments, statutes, testimonies, law. He's talking about His word. This has the power to change lives and we have to get it in here so it'll come out of there and it can make a difference in other people. Verse 10, he says, more to be desired are they than gold. Now wait a minute. Your study time, your personal time with God in the Bible is more valuable than a pound of gold. If I put a pound of gold and a Bible up here and I gave you a choice, well, we know what the flesh would want. Man, you know what you can do with a pound of gold? You know how much that stuff goes for per ounce? Man, that's a lot of money. That's a car sitting right there, right? You could buy a cow. <laughs> but... Well, 2,000 an ounce. You can get a bunch of cows. <laughs> bunch of cows with that. I want you to understand, God's trying to tell us this is clean, it's pure, it's righteous, it's enlightening. This is enlightening. The, the, the world is going after woke. He wants you to awake to righteousness and sin not. This will enlighten your eyes. This will give you true understanding. The problem is we don't get alone with Him in it and search for Him. He says, more to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them, that's the word, is thy servant warned. And this is what we need. Sometimes we need a warning. Hey, buddy, you're moving in the wrong direction. God sees what you're doing. You know he doesn't like it. If you don't change, he'll destroy you. He says, moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. You know what the Bible does? Sometimes you think you're doing pretty good, and then you get in it, and you're like, oh, I've been kind of failing on that. I've been full of pride or bitterness or unforgiving, or maybe I've been gossiping, or I've been holding a grudge. Maybe there's things that I, didn't, I wouldn't have counted as a sin. It's kind of like, well, I'm not doing all the big stuff, but there's still things that God's working on you about, and we see it in the Word. And it says, cleanse me from secret faults. That's saying, God, if there's sin in my life and I don't know about it, I'm sorry, and help me to see it so I can get clean. He says in verse 13, keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. We talked about a sin unto death previously. 
A presumptuous sin is to know exactly what it is and to walk right into it. There, it's not a secret fault. This is not ignorance. You know what you're doing and you choose to do it anyway as you sin against the Lord. In the Old Testament, there were certain presumptuous sins that literally said, okay, take them outside of the city and pick up stones and hit them with stones until they die. Like there are some pretty big ones. He's like, no, no, this one, although they may be saved and go to heaven, but in the flesh their time is up. It's a sin unto death. There were several sins like that. They had a rock party for them, right? They took them out and the, <laughs> threw rocks on them in the ditch. This presumptuous sin, look at it. He says, keep back thy servants also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression, the sin unto death. Lord, don't let sin rule in my life so much that I continue to sin against you and grieve your Holy Spirit, and I ignore you and my conscience. And then finally, judgment comes. Lord, help me to not let sin have dominion over me. Do you see it? Look at verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. He's calling on the Lord and he's saying, hey God, you know what I say and you know what I think and you've forgiven me, but I keep sinning against you. And I need your help, I need your strength, I need your power. Help me to stop saying the things that displease you. Help me to stop doing those things and thinking those things that just dishonor you. He says, let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Isn't that interesting? God sees your thoughts. If we could read your heart like a book this morning, there's probably some things you'd be embarrassed about or you'd be ashamed of. If you will, go to Psalm 51. Go to Psalm 51. In Daniel 12, he said, And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. I want to encourage you in these darker times, not just seasonally in the year, uh, but spiritually in our nation, now is the time for you to take a stand on righteousness and the Word of God. Now is the time for you to do a spiritual intervention and, and tell your brother or sister in Christ, listen, you're going the wrong direction. You're not living for God. You're living for the TV schedule. You're living for uh, soccer and sports and careers and houses and all these other things. And one day you're going to stand before God and you're going to realize it means absolutely nothing and you're going to regret it. You're going down a path where you're living for yourself and you, you could care less what God wants and if you don't change, He will correct you. It's very important that as Christians we preach this. And here's the thing, guys. We, you know, we have to do it in love. I'm not asking you to be a jerk. <coughs> we show mercy as God does and we do it out of compassion as the Lord does. But didn't He say, as many as I love I chasten. As many as I love, I rebuke. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Boy, that's how the Lord would talk to you personally, one-on-one. -on -one. How do you as a Christian do it? Do you do it out of love? Are you warning people what the Bible says? And I mean, with a smile, just tell them, don't you know that's not what the Bible says? Hey, don't you know better? God expects more out of us. Psalm 51, verse number 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. He's talking about your heart and your mind. God wants you to be true in who you really are. Desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. The, the hyssop in the Bible, today if you go to the apothecary, they'll call it Mediterranean oregano. It is an amazing herb. God told them to use it in a particular fashion. When somebody had died, they would clean out the tent, the house, with hyssop and ashes 
uh, uh, oil. I mean, I mean, there's all the purging elements that were necessary. He gave us a physical picture of a cleansing agent. I've heard somebody say that, oh boy, if you have to go into the sewer, they'll use oregano because it's a disinfectant. What is it? Antimicrobial, antifungal, antibacterial, anti-carcinogenic. It's all sorts of amazing thing, amazing characteristics. It's an herb that God did. And he says, listen, I'm talking spiritually, but I want, I want you to know all the things that they use this for physically. I want you to think about the Word and what it can do for you spiritually. That perfect law of liberty, the Word of God. How it can give you true freedom when you submit to it. Look, he says in verse 7, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. He was corrected by the Lord pretty heavy. You guys know what I'm talking about. This was David. Verse 9, Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. We have the power of prayer to God. Lord, I'm confessing it. I was wrong. I know you've already paid for it in eternity, but I'm asking you to forgive me now. And I want to turn from it now. I want to be zealous and repent. I want to get back on the correct path so I don't spend out my days just living for sin. Look what he says in verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. This is like a spiritual reboot. Maybe it's time for you to ask God, God, give me, renew my spirit. Hey, you were given a new heart at the moment you got saved. You were given a new man, if you will. The possibility of a new spirit and a new life and all things can become new now. But sometimes we go back to the old ways and we go with the old man and we do those old sins that there's nothing but disease and disaster and death. And he says, no, get off of that and go to God and say, God, will you help me to reboot my heart? Will you help me to recalibrate my heart? Will you renew my spirit and help me to have the kind of spirit that you want me to have? He says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now, the Old Covenant, there's only two ways to be saved. There was the Old Testament Covenant, where you believed that Jesus would come, the Lamb of God. And then Jesus came, and there's the New Covenant. You believe that Jesus has come, that He was the Lamb of God. But with the New Covenant, we get the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told us about it in John 14, 15, 16, that the Spirit of truth will be in us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. He says, I will dwell with you. We'll make our dwelling with you. So God God is in us through His Spirit, and He'll never leave us, but we grieve Him. Now back then, this is David talking about what he saw with King Saul, how King Saul rejected God and rebelled against Him, and it said that the Lord allowed an evil spirit to come into Saul's life. And he was prophesying of an evil spirit, and he was throwing spears at people, trying to kill those that he loved. David said, God, oh, don't do that to me. Oh, Lord, I love you. I'm sorry. Make, give me a clean heart. I've sinned against you. Please forgive me and give me another chance. Help me to get things right. Help me to see things your way. I don't want to be cold to the Holy Spirit. I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 12, he says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Salvation is free and it lasts forever. And David was saved at this moment that he was caught being an adulterer and a murderer. And he says, I, he didn't say restore salvation. He can't lose it. He said restore the joy that can come with salvation. Oh Lord, would you help me to have a joyful heart? Would you give me a clean spirit and mind? Would you help me to reset my mind? He says, uphold me with thy free spirit. Boy, freedom only comes from the Lord. I'm very thankful for the freedom that we have in Christ. He's given us forgiveness. But now He's also given us power through the Holy Spirit. And He has a plan. He wants us to live for Him. And then He's going to give us everything we need to do it. And sometimes we choose to go off the path. And if you convert someone and get them back on the path, there's a great reward for you. And you're preventing them from destroying their life. What a blessing. He says in verse 13, Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. 
Notice what David is saying. Now, Lord, I've really messed up. I did something so horrible, and I need your forgiveness. Thank you for your forgiveness. Now, would you help me to change my mind and change my life and change my thinking and change my direction? And now I'm going to tell others, don't go down that path. Use me to teach sinners and convert them unto you. Look what he says again in verse 13. Then will I teach transgressors thy way, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. David probably had a lot of people in his kingdom that were watching closely as they saw the greatest man in the kingdom fall to a new low. And when he poured it out to the Lord and he asked the Lord for help, and now he, he got back up and he's telling others, don't do what I did. Don't do what you're doing. You'll destroy yourself. If you would, go to Ephesians chapter 4. Go to Ephesians chapter 4 in the New Testament. I really believe that God's will is sometimes He wants you to warn somebody that the problems in their life, it's because God's curse is on their life because they're sinning against Him. They've given up on Him. They're going in a new direction. They're going in the wrong direction. And God wants you to stand up and tell them the truth. He says, brethren, if one, he says, if you err from the truth, if you err from the truth, you go away from truth toward error. You've left the truth. You're off the path of truth. You're on the path of lies. You're lying to yourself that it's fun, that it's going to be okay, that God won't judge you for it. You're lying to yourself that, that, that all these people are your friends. Many people go down this path looking for acceptance from the wrong people. They've left the path of truth. He says, get them back on the path. Convert them to get back on that right path. He says, in, you're in Ephesians 4, find verse number 17. This I say therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. He says, don't walk like the rest of the world. They're puffed up in their mind. Verse 18, having the understanding darkened. Did you know that there are Christians on the wrong path right now and they don't understand? They've lost wisdom. Uh, it's in Hebrews it talks about, it's like you need to be taught the first principles all over again. You know how to use the Bible like a sword and it's a big old stake. There's some deep stuff in there, but now you're like a baby that can only handle the milk because you're not obeying. He says, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. Remember, that's what David said. Don't alienate me. Oh Lord, I want to be close to you. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. When you turn a blind eye to sin and you do it again and you justify sin and then you finally, you give in a little bit and you get a little closer to it and you say, well, it's not that bad and you keep going closer and closer down the wrong path. I mean, it's like you're driving uh, you know what I'm talking about? And you start hitting that, those bumps in the middle, those little lights, boom, 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 boom. And there's traffic coming at you and you're like, well, it's not that bad. I'm just in the middle, boom, 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 boom. Convert someone and turn them back in the right direction. Have a spiritual intervention because you love them. Verse 19, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness. You know what he's saying? Natural feelings celebrating when somebody celebrates and weeping when they weep and caring for people and uh, wanting to see them to thrive in God. Natural, good, godly feelings. He says they're past that. They don't feel anything. What do they feel? Selfishness. He says, uh, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. That is the party lifestyle. That is greedily getting whatever makes you feel good, taking from other people and being okay with it. You don't care. You're in, you're in it for you. Verse 20, he warns you. Here's the warning. He says, but ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus. He says, you learned something different. As a Christian, that path is not for you. You stay away from that path and that lifestyle. Yeah, but that's my family. That's, we've just always been that way. No, I don't believe that. I've heard people say to me, oh, you're Irish. Well, you, the Irish are drinkers, you know? And I'm like, not me, buddy. I don't want to be involved in that. I'm not going to claim some territorial sin the devil has over, oh, I'm Irish. I guess I have to be a drunk and an alcoholic and uh, destroy my family and destroy my liver and my body. No, 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 no. 
Don't give the devil that stronghold in your life. Rather, you rebuke someone, you convert them to get back on the right path. He says, you have not so learned Christ. If so be that you have heard Him. Verse 21, look at it. He says, if so be that you have heard Him and have been taught by Him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off. Put off. I want you to see these next couple statements and we'll be done. Put off, put on, and put away. Put off, put on, and put away. Look what he says. Verse 22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. He's talking about your flesh. This is the old man, what you can see. You cannot see the new man, but you can see the fruit in the works of the new man. And, uh, you know, you see the Holy Spirit working in my life. All I see of you is the old person because that's the flesh. It's dead. It's deceitful and full of lust. Do you understand what he's saying here? The conversation in the Bible, this language, we use it as like I was talking with somebody. The word originally is used and has a deeper meaning of your walk and your talk. Your conversation is more like what people say about you, where they see you going, how they see you treat other people, what excites you, what makes you angry, the things that you talk about. So the conversation is your walk and your talk. Do you only get excited for football, but not church? Do you only get excited for uh, drugs, but not Jesus? I mean, think about it. He, the, what he's saying is, what's your reputation as a Christian? He says, put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. Think about it, right? Take off that old jacket, that garment of filthy rags, and give it to the Lord. Take it off and begin to change. He says in verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. There it is again. Be renewed. Get a reset. Get a new spirit. Clean your heart. Convert your mind to think as Christ does. Put off the old man, he says. Verse 24. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Well, you have the new man inside of you. God has given you the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You're now a new creature. You're like a new creation. Uh, you used to have body, soul, and spirit, but now you also have the Holy Spirit. So you're completely new. And with that, that's who you are. So use the power of the Holy Spirit that's inside of you for true holiness. Read it again. He says that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness, in true holiness. You understand, you cannot do any righteous works in your flesh until you get saved. Being a good person in this world will not get you to heaven and you won't be rewarded in hell. Right? Once you're saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can be righteous and do good works and there's a pile of rewards waiting for you when you get there. There are many ways that we work together. God pieces this body together and from the least of us unto the greatest, from the youngest to the oldest, God has a plan for you to fit in this big picture as a puzzle piece to support the preaching of the gospel, the teaching of the doctrines, discipleship and growth and encouragement. We come together in the church to help build each other up. Look, he says in verse 25, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man the truth with his neighbor. All right, so he says, put off the old man, put on the new man, and now, verse 25, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. He says, be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Uh, he's warning us that in the wrong spirit, you let the devil in your house. If you would go to Colossians chapter 3 real quick. Colossians chapter number 3. And if you would look at verse number 8, it tells us the same concept. But now ye also, Colossians 3.8, but now ye also put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, 
filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created Him. We're supposed to be renewed in the image of Christ and begin to look like Christ. And most Christians miss this. They just sit down, they go back to watching TV, they get apathetic, and they give up on the Christian life. Uh, back up to verse number 5 real quick. Verse number 5. Mortify therefore your members. Now, what does, what does mortify mean? Put to death. What, what is, what is mortify? Is that a Spanish word? Isn't there a Spanish word that's similar? What, what is that word? To die. Mortify. Put to death. He says this old man, this old way, that wrong path, he says you need to die to that. A dead man doesn't care if there's a party next door. He says put it to death. He said, just die to that lifestyle. He says, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is an idolatry. He says, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. He said, listen, that's your old life. You need to die to the old life. Instead, he says, put on the new man. Verse 10, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that hath created him. Now look at verse 16. This is important. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. You know, one of the biggest things a Christian can do, especially a new Christian, is let the Word of Christ dwell in them richly. One of the greatest things you can do is sing the Bible and sing some of these spiritual songs that we're singing that honor the Lord and talk about His forgiveness and talk about His coming and talk about His love that He has for us. Listen, if it wasn't for the love of Christ, we'd all be in trouble. If we got what we deserved, we'd all go to hell. And now that we're saved, He wants us, literally, remember He said, to convert a sinner. Convert your fellow brother or sister in Christ. And, you know, this is not a popular topic because I'm, I'm asking you to try to provoke others to serve God with the rest of their life. I really believe this is why God brings us together in the church. If you would go back to James 5, and we'll finish there. Look at verse number 10, please. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord. When he says the prophets, you know who he's talking about? These guys. He says, listen to what they have to say to you. They have a word for you from the Lord. He says, take the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure, Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. God will have pity on us when we don't deserve it. God will give us mercy when we don't deserve it. He says, go and listen to them and learn from them that God wants to draw you to live for Him. And now again, look at verse number 19. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Last Sunday I preached about a friend of mine that passed many years ago. He was clearly on the wrong path. As I meditate on this passage here, I have to wonder if there would have been an opportunity for me to inject some truth into him. I believe that he was saved. I believe I'll see him when I get to heaven. I know that he died young and he died early because he was chasing sin. And if I had 
the boldness as a Christian, and I was filled with the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit upon me, and I didn't care if I would suffer affliction for rebuking Him. Usually we don't do things because we're afraid of what people are going to think about us. Listen, they were tortured in the Old Testament. They were tortured in the New Testament. And I'm just asking you to go to a fellow brother or sister in Christ and say, man, I want to help you. I'm praying for you. I see your problem, and I want to help you. Get back on the path of truth. He says that if you convert the sinner from the error of his way, he shall save a soul from death. You know you can literally save somebody's life if you preach the truth of the Bible to them. I don't know who this message is for, and I know it's just kind of a simple message about calling others and converting others before the Lord chastises them and brings them home. I just pray that it's a reminder that, that whoever this is for, I believe that the Lord wants me to preach it this morning, and if it's for you, turn it around. Or if God's calling you to rebuke somebody in your family or at work to get it right with God before they kill themselves, I pray that you would have the boldness in the Spirit to do it with love. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much, and I thank you for these passages. Lord, I just ask that you would use it. Lord, I know that your Word is powerful and you're loving. Lord, I ask that you would help us to be Christians that honor you for the rest of our days. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.